I'm a representing Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh for the first time. I got a permanent position a year ago and I study organismal biology. So we're going to jump up a few levels, although we've been talking about big topics like agriculture in terms of plants and plant traits and genetic pathways, um, chemical pathways. Um, I'm going to talk about the organismal point of view. So we're going to uh, have a story of how does it feel being a plant and how does it feel being a plant through time. So the uh, problem with plants is that they are stuck where they are. They have few options. They can move, they can evolve, they can adapt or they can go extinct. And that is true every moment of their lives. A single species, how long does it persist? Is it millions of years? Is it 100,000 years? We don't know answers to those questions. And that's something that we study in terms of understanding what's the background to the traits that plants carry in their genome. And you could think plants as a rucksack. So in the, the far corner, you can see a yellow rucksack. Imagine that's a plant. All, that, all those traits you might be interested, all the pathways you might be looking at, they are inside that rucksack. Sometimes the rucksack, um, you can just open it and you can see the tools and that's it, that's the genome. But then there's all the stuff that happens when the plants start using the tools that we can't just simply see by looking at it. But the plants also have a history and they have a context. So they, they also have a meaning in terms of space and time. And that's the question mark that I, I get puzzled with and I, I deal with during my working hours. So if you think that as a truly plant, that's a puya in the monocots. So there's an there's a angiosperm there floating about, but it also has a context. It has a community that it lives in. The community has competition. They have pathogens, they have root systems, there's soils, there's climate, there's weather. But they also have a geological background. They also have that history and there's nothing quite like it than the Andes to show that to you visually. Those mountains went there always and those plants have had to either move there to the Andes, to these new environments, or they must have adapted to these new conditions that rose. So it's a natural lab to really study niche evolution or the evolution of adaptation through time. And these are time scales of millions of years. So the uh, four choices that a plant has every moment in their lives, moving, adapting, evolving, or going extinct, is what you can ask, either in the past, right now, or for the future. And um, my studies took me early on in my PhD um, to the Andes. It's a um, hotspot of diversity and as I showed in those few slides, it's diverse in its ecosystem, in the climates that you can find in there. It's often depicted as a single hotspot just to show you where it is on a map. But the question in my PhD was, is it truly a single spot when it comes to a plant? How does a plant experience it, both in terms of space and time? So those plants that grow in there right now, the plants that are endemic, there's 45,000 species of vascular plants along the whole of the Andes. They extend 6,000 kilometers and they are up to 6,900 meters uh, high. So how do, the, how do the plants see it? And in terms of visual uh, demonstration of the environmental extremes, you have 18 degree temperature gradient in mean annual temperatures along the Andes, 18 degrees. Climate change projections are something along the lines of, okay, maximum four degrees. 18 degrees along this line, what do plants do, is a really interesting question. So at the very bottom, when Darwin arrived to South America, he faced the desert. The whole coast is desert when it comes to the Peruvian coast, for example, in central Andes. You then move about, you get something seasonally dry. So there is um, humidity, but it's uh, restricted. Then you climb again, a few thousand meters up, and this is where I'm still alive. Sandy is running around. Um, and there's humidity and there's plants and orchids, epiphytes, there's this continuous humidity. We call them cloud forests. And then you go one step up, and this is where I start passing out, when we get to 4,500 meters, the plants are still doing fine, but it's total Arctic ecosystem. You could compare it to um, something uh, that we can see up in Scotland. So how do plants experience this? So the idea that I wanted to test at a time was, do plants experience it um, quite labile? Can they move along? The plants that were there, did they climb up and adapt to these new conditions as the mountains rose? Or is it perhaps more of a map with different ecosystems that are as if islands, restricting the plant evolution? 
So within each uh, color symbol, we have an ecosystem here in the plaque. There would be the seasonally dry forests and those uh, desert-like environments. And plants that are adapted to those conditions, do they follow that through their evolution? Can they break that barrier to the humid montane forest or the Arctic tundra where you have massive, um, uh, you need frost tolerance, for example? So we did this using molecular phylogenies, and uh, you could take a genus, and here's four different lineages, some including multiple genera, but there are four different um, angiosperm lineages. And we have every single tip is a different species. So here we have two very specious genera of plants and two less uh, diverse. And everything in grey is um, from these seasonally dry forests. They are endemic to these um, biomes that are seasonally dry and you have to have drought adaptations. And what we were figuring out is that once the lineage arrives to one single valley, in this case, uh, the Marañón Valley, it stays there and it speciates in situ, as if on an island. It doesn't break into a neighbouring biome as, as the mountains evolve. And we dated these to understand the spatial and the um, time um, aspect of the evolution. And they correlate well with the, um, with the um, evolution of the Andes, so the uh, lineages endemic to the low elevations are much older than the ones that adapted to those most recent climates at the tips of the Andes, those ones that are so similar to Scotland, for example. Here's another example to demonstrate this conservatism of the major niches and those uh, climatic adaptations. It's a case study of lupins. So lupins are maybe something you are familiar with from gardens, but um, most of them are native to, um, to the Americas. There's a clade uh, from uh, USA, and they are colored in red. And you can see they are, um, they are sister to Brazilian lineage that's um, diversified in Brazilian paramos, you could call them. And uh, from this, um, uh, Hughes and Eastwood derived that actually the Andean radiation adapted to these um, very northern, you could say northern hemisphere climates at the tips of the Andes, the lineages that made it there weren't the ones nearby. They were lineages that had to move all the way from uh, up north from the Rockies because they carried those pre-adaptations to frost tolerance. And the idea that Donahue so nicely put in our PNAS paper, it is truly easier for plants to move than evolve these through these major barriers. So we're talking about major climatic barriers, but some things might not be as hard. So the story isn't as simple as that. So to summarize what we're learning from these kind of studies of molecular phylogenies is that in some ecosystems like the Cejado, there is a Brazilian savanna. So it's a fire-dominated system where there's a much C4 grasses adapted to the tropical dry conditions. Um, soil fertility is low, so they're very differently uh, adapted lineages to the dry forests that I, I was talking about here. And these lineages that are endemic to the Cejado going through these fire cycles regularly have to adapt to the fire. So there's thick underground roots, there's high um, long trunk and where the leaves are only at the top and so on. And these adaptations that we would see so um, uh, crucial for the environment, and we would think, oh, those are complex morphological traits. What they figured out using this molecular phylogeny of endemic lineages is that they have evolved multiple times, much more than you would expect by random. The opposite of those drought tolerant um, adaptations that we're finding in the Andes, where it's both perhaps the geography and the ecology that is restricting plant evolution. So, the, so sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy, and we're really learning from these larger scale studies what traits are how labile, how often do they evolve, and what lineages might be interesting, which lineages might be exceptions. You could also look at morphology. So I then um, went into Solanaceae. So it's a wonderful family of, um, of about 3,000 species of um, plants around the world. And here on the, on the left you see floral morphology within the single family. And you can see there's a lot going on. You can also see the fruit morphology. So we have potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants from this single family. And actually, all those three are just from a single genus. Of course, potato that we eat isn't a fruit. So, um, so that's not a strict comparison. But the question is truly, where do these traits evolve? Or how have they evolved? What is the background to these traits? It could be a genetic pathway. It could be a chemical pathway uh, that you're looking at. So in terms of Solanaceae, um, the diversity is about 2,700 species, and within a single genus Solanum, we find nearly half of um, the diversity. 
And here are some of the most used aspects of the family that we know on our plates. What we wanted to do is put that into a context, give a fa uh, the family uh, the most updated phylogeny. So um, currently we have um, about 1,075 um, sequences out there ready for people to use and understand trait evolution. But what was really missing, and so here you see a single phylogeny, but it's split into two because simply it becomes impossible to visualize it. So we start understanding relationships, but you can also date it. But to get time calibrations to phylogenies, doing it properly with the most sophisticated models of molecular evolution that accounts for the fact that lineages might evolve at different rates, affected by their life cycle, for example, we need fossil calibration points. So we did a fossil review with Sandy et al. and really wanted to understand how much do we know about the history. And that's actually back to physics. You have to use CT scanning, you know, when they scan your skull if you have an accident. That's what you do with fossils these days. So it was quite interesting times where you could see actually the endosperm if it's there. So you can actually get to the inside of a fossil. So that was a uh, learning curve. So what we were able to produce is a time calibrated phylogeny where you can then start understanding trait evolution or maybe it's an evolution of an insect lineage that is endemic to Solanaceae that is restricted to using these plants as it's, uh, during its life cycle. So it's hopefully opening a whole toolbox for people trying to understand whatever it is in these organisms they want to understand in terms of space and time. What my interest truly is, is niche evolution. So understanding how do those plants um, cope along those Andean slopes. And um, we got a National Geographic grant to explore ecological, uh, ecological specialization in plants in terms of range size. So do things that we consider threatened, things that are restricted to a single um, site perhaps, are they ecologically more specialized? So we often think that's the case, but actually knowing the Andes, I would argue that's not the case. So I wanted to really explore that to see perhaps rainfall uh, gradients that species are able to tolerate they are not correlated with geographic range size at all. That's our hypothesis from the Andes, purely from ecological conditions you, uh, you observe along the, um, along the slopes. So we got a, a grant to go and explore and find everything of, uh, belonging to the genus Selenium along the Andes. And here's Sandy and um, Paul Gonzalez from uh, Universidad de San Marcos from Lima, who is our um, collaborator in the project. And uh, this is one of my favorite solanum species. You wouldn't quite believe it can survive. It's the tiniest little thing, but it manages to, uh, to produce both flowers and fruits in sand dunes at 4,000 meter elevation. How it does that, I'm not quite sure. How it even finds the sand dunes, because they're very rare habitat. So the question is, we want to really understand everything of solanum within a single hotspot. So we can't know everything of solanum around the world, although that is our aim. One day we're going to do it. But right now we thought, let's focus in one country and know everything about it. The single country includes all world's major biomes, and there's a 6,800 meter elevational gradient. So it's the best place to really study how do plants deal with geography versus ecology. So that task is quite big. So I, I uh, applied for a little field grant, but of course then the task is to analyze the data. So the question is how many species are there first? And count 293 right now, but that's not easy. You have to see every single specimen from that country collected anywhere in the world, ideally, of course you can't quite do this, and you have to identify it. Knowing that many species is not an easy task. I know a fraction of that. And unless there would be a person like Sandy Knapp, we couldn't answer these questions. So that's the first task. And where do they occur? That's about not only putting a name for each single point that somebody's collected, but actually putting a coordinate to it. These specimens don't always come with coordinates. And that's a task in itself. That's a very time-consuming task to do it with accuracy that you need in the Andes, where one kilometer difference could, could cause you um, overestimation of the niche. And then, of course, you want to run these points. And because we only might know, we, out of the 300 species, half of them we know properly enough to model. And that's being liberal. So we have... For half of those species, we have more than five points. Five points is not a robust data set to build a model. Everybody who works on any level of modeling will, will understand that. Over a spatial scale, that is the whole of Peru. So what does the data look like? We thought, well, how, how do I communicate the task ahead when, when it's obvious to us, but it might be hard to give it in a perspective? So UK, 
has 240,000 square kilometres. We have 20 million collections of vascular plants right now available, geo-referenced, in GBIF, which is one of the hubs of this kind of data. Thank God it exists, it makes this kind of research easy, but it gives you an idea. That makes 82.1 collections per square kilometre. 82 plants per square, anywhere where you would go, on average. And there are 4,000 species that that data covers. In Peru, however, we have um, 1 million... 0.2 square kilometers, we have less than a million collections and actually counts into less than, less than one, well, one collection every second um, square kilometer you're going to hit. But the flora is massive, it's 20,000 species. So you can see how much we don't know. <coughs> Peru is also the uh, most likely place to find our new species on the planet based on models from Cambridge um, Biology. Um, what they're estimating is that 29% of the world's remaining species to be found in vascular plants is in Peru and Ecuador alone. And in their models, of course these are models, they were estimating 6,900 species of vascular plants alone to be found. So that, these numbers are estimates. So that gives you an idea of what we're dealing with, to understand plant niche really out in the wild where niches are under selection. So uh, during that process we of course bump into new species. So um, this was a nice story of a hidden little uh, morphological entity amongst uh, global weed, and that's a really common story. This is how the data looks like. You know, um, yesterday we got a wonderful slide about shipping lines around the world. There didn't have to be a world map behind it. You could see the world, and this is the same about solanum. This is mainly just solanum data from, uh, in our database. So it's a single database. Every single point is taxonomically verified, and we are going hopefully crazy with georeferencing. It takes time but we're building it up. What's really interesting is that although I've been focusing on ecological specialization and, and the fact that there's diversity in the Andes that is uh, endemic, so it's quite geographically rare, there are also supertramps. We call these supertramps because they seem to be able to tolerate this gradient of, um, of course, all the way to the top, it's 18 degrees in mean annual temperature, but it's 6,000 meter elevation and they seem to be able to do at least three of these squares. That's astonishing if you think about it. There's not, if you think this gradient that we're talking about somewhere in Europe, you would have to go to Greenland and Northern Africa. I mean, that's crazy. How many species do we know that do that? And these simply are happy to do that and morphological variation doesn't seem to come into play. But this has to be something varying within them and that biodiversity seems interesting. Um, so the question is, what is going on? And there's, of course, multiple of these multiples examples, but in how many cases do we understand the taxonomy well enough? So we're trying to focus in solanum. There's a clade in, in my specialization within solanum in the moraloids. There's a clade that uh, all of the four species do this. And what I'd really like to now explore with some of our master students is simply look at the neutral divergence and correlate that with ecology and geography to understand which way are they being driven by, which way are they moving. And the same you could ask with any trait. You could overlay that into that space and understand what correlates with that neutral diversity and, and how are the patterns. Resistance gene diversity would be really interesting to look at, but of course it's a very complex issue. So the point, just to wrap up, is that as, as I've shown, hopefully, that there are four four things that plants look at through their life um, on the planet. It's every moment they're thinking, moving, adapting, evolving or going extinct. And what the data is, in summary, some of this data isn't data that I've shown today, is that broad scale niches are highly conserved. So those um, tolerances to those major biomes within the Andes are conserved and species or lineages seemingly are unable to cross those borders. So plants move rather than evolve, with occasional exceptions, especially in the Cejado, fire adaptations seem to be more easy to come about. Extinctions are unavoidable, but in, in essence, we're not really interested in them. They are, they, it's hopeless, it's a terminal disease. But really, like it was really nicely pointed out yesterday, the greatest potential, I think, even from our point of view, is the plant adaptation. How do these plants cope? Uh, what is in their rack sack that enables them to be across 4,000 meter elevational gradient. And that's something truly remarkable that makes you quite humble when you see it in the nature. 
So thanks to Sandy, for example, who's one of my main, major collaborators, Paul Gonzalez uh, in Peru, and the other colleagues around the world, um, Joao in Brazil, and uh, whole sets uh, more. So this type of work really wouldn't be uh, um, possible without a large team of happy, happy bouncers uh, in the field. Um, so I'd like to thank for your attention.